Hello and welcome to lecture number eight. This presentation will explore the way in which the national government took shape in the years following the ratification of the Constitution. The lecture will address many important themes. First, we'll investigate the history of several key institutions established during the presidency of George Washington, such as the makeup of the judicial branch, foundations of American foreign policy, and the emergence of political parties. We will also explore how the second president, John Adams, addressed opposition to war with France during his administration. A true spirit of cooperation was seen in the years following the ratification of the Constitution as several institutions were established under the new government. One of the first orders of business was the election of a president. George Washington did not seek the office, however, in February of 1789, the Electoral College met and unanimously chose Washington to be the nation's first president. His vice president was John Adams. The image here depicts Washington's journey to the nation's temporary capital in New York City. Washington was the most admired man in 18th century America. Even before the Constitution was ratified, his name was widely proposed for the presidency. This painting captures the enthusiasm of the crowd gathered to see their hero take the oath of office. Because he served as the nation's first president, each step he took would serve as a model or precedent for those who would follow. One precedent set by Washington dealt with his cabinet, the president's most important set of advisors. He chose four individuals from different parts of the nation to lead the most important executive departments. Henry Knox, from Massachusetts, was named Secretary of War. Fellow Virginians Edmund Randolph and Thomas Jefferson were named Attorney General and Secretary of State. And from New York, Alexander Hamilton became the first Treasury Secretary. Jefferson and Hamilton were probably the leading members of Washington's cabinet. With the executive department addressed, Congress set to work on accomplishing two important tasks. The first was to organize the judiciary, and it did so with the Judiciary Act of 1789. First, the Judiciary Act established a six-member United States Supreme Court. John Jay was nominated by President Washington and then confirmed by the Senate to become the nation's first Chief Justice. Secondly, it established 13 federal district courts, one for each state. Finally, it gave the Supreme Court the power to review decisions of the states, thereby reinforcing the fact that the Supreme Court was the highest court in the land. Another task for Congress was to pass a Bill of Rights. This had been promised by supporters of the Constitution to appease anti-federalists during the fight for ratification. Congress proposed several amendments and ten were adopted by the states and became part of the Constitution in 1791. The Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Their primary author was James Madison. Some have called the First Amendment the most important included in the Bill of Rights. It protected the rights of free speech, press, and religion. It also protected the right to peacefully assemble and to petition the government. The Second Amendment protected the right of the people to keep and bear arms, as many felt the nation had no need of a large standing army. Other important amendments prohibited unreasonable searches of people's homes and protected the rights of those accused of crimes by allowing for jury trials in some cases and barred cruel and unusual punishment. Still other amendments reserved power for the states and the people. Taken together, they're an important set of rights that serve to make the nation unique, even today. For more information about the Bill of Rights, you may click on the hyperlink below. As the workings of the government continued, Washington placed a great deal of confidence in Alexander Hamilton, his Secretary of the Treasury. Eventually, however, Hamilton's proposals proved to be controversial to some. Alexander Hamilton was born in the West Indies and came to live in New York in 1772. During the Revolutionary War, he served on Washington's staff and became quite close to the general. As Treasury Secretary, he hoped to shape the new nation's fiscal policies. This was first seen with the nation's debt. Hamilton hoped to concentrate the country's debt in the national government so when prominent Americans invested heavily in the United States government, it would give them a stake in the success of the nation. During the Revolutionary War, the United States had acquired a debt of about $54 million. 
Hamilton proposed the United States pay off the foreign debt, and then the national government would assume the debt acquired by the states, therefore making them beholden to the national government. Several states with large debts, like Massachusetts, supported his proposals, but many others, several of which were from the South, like Virginia and Maryland, had already paid off their debt. It seemed as if his financial plans were doomed to failure in Congress, until once again a compromise solution was reached. This took place following a meeting with Thomas Jefferson. Representatives from several southern states did not support assumption of state debt. They had already paid theirs off and didn't want to fund the debts of other states. But they did want the nation's capital to be located in the south. So they agreed to assumption in return for placing the new permanent location for the nation's capital in the south along the Potomac River in what is now Washington, D.C. Hamilton wasn't through with his fiscal proposals. He also supported the creation of a national bank. This would benefit the nation because it would allow the government a place to deposit tax revenues and help to regulate state banks. It also wouldn't cost taxpayers any money. Congress passed legislation creating the institution, however, there was one problem. Was the proposal allowed by the Constitution? Jefferson argued that no, the Constitution did not allow for the creation of a national bank because the Constitution did not specifically grant Congress the power to do so. This was a power strictly reserved to the states. In developing this line of thought, he espoused what came to be known as a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Hamilton countered with a different argument by offering a loose interpretation of the Constitution. He argued the Bank of the United States should be allowed because of the Constitution's Necessary and Proper Clause, or the Elastic Clause, which allowed Congress to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to carry out its functions. Washington agreed with Hamilton and signed legislation creating the Bank of the United States, granting the bank a charter for 20 years. One final item associated with Hamilton's policies resulted in the Whiskey Rebellion. To help raise revenues for the government, a tax of seven cents per gallon was placed on the sale of whiskey. When crowds in western Pennsylvania protested the tax and intimidated tax collectors in actions reminiscent of the American Revolution, President Washington responded with surprising strength. He led a militia of 13,000 to disperse the rebels. This was important as it demonstrated the new government would not allow for violent resistance to its policies. We'll now explore issues of foreign policy during the era of the early republic. In 1789, revolution broke out in France. Many Americans, particularly Thomas Jefferson and his followers, rejoiced. However, it turned violent in the early 1790s and the king himself was executed. As fighting broke out among the European nations, the United States was still bound to the French by a treaty first developed during the revolution. Considerable pressure was placed on the nation to choose sides in this European war. The man shown here, Citizen Genet, was dispatched as a representative of the French government. The Americans received his diplomatic credentials, yet George Washington simultaneously issued a proclamation of neutrality in the European war, thereby invalidating the previous alliance with France. Relations with the British remained problematic. In defiance of the Treaty of Paris, British troops continued to occupy several forts in the Northwest Territory. There, they engaged in the fur trade and openly traded goods with Native Americans opposed to the United States. They also seized several American ships, along with their cargoes, and impressed sailors into service for the Royal Navy. Jeffersonians, in particular, were upset. To avoid war with the British, Washington sent Chief Justice John Jay to London. There, he negotiated the terms of Jay's Treaty, but was unfortunately unable to win many concessions. The British agreed to leave the military posts out west, and agreed to pay damages for the past seizure of American goods. However, they made no pledge to stop their actions in the future. Jay's Treaty was very unpopular in the United States, especially among followers of Jefferson. He made no inroads into the American goal of protecting the trading rights of neutral nations during wartime. But he didn't have much to bargain with. Even though it was unpopular, it was important because it did avoid war at that time. There were two areas of concern in America's relations with Spain. First, many in the West and South hoped to gain access to the Mississippi River and particularly the port of New Orleans, which would allow access to much broader markets. 
Secondly, the proper boundary dividing Spanish Florida from American holdings in the southeast was disputed, as shown with this map on the right. Thomas Pinckney traveled to Spain to negotiate an agreement with the Spanish government. He returned with what many have called Pinckney's Treaty, but it's more properly known as the Treaty of San Lorenzo. The treaty granted the United States unrestricted free access to the Mississippi and the port of New Orleans. Secondly, Spain recognized the 31st parallel as the boundary between Florida and American territory. This is the map shown earlier. The arrow points to the 31st parallel, which became the recognized border between the holdings of both the Americans and Spanish. Overall, Pinckney's Treaty was a tremendous accomplishment for the nation and quite popular in the United States. By the end of Washington's term in office, it was clear that differing views over the future of the American government were emerging in the form of two political parties. One group was named the Federalist. They were led by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. While George Washington stayed above the partisan bickerings, he most often sided with the views of the Federalists. They were strongest in the Northeast, where they supported a strong national government and tended to have pro-business orientations. They adopted a loose interpretation of the Constitution and tended to be pro-British in foreign policy. The opposing group was named the Democratic Republicans, and they were most associated with the views of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. They were strongest in the South and West, where they supported states' rights and small farmers. They advocated a strict interpretation of the Constitution and tended to be pro-French in their foreign policy. As Washington was set to leave office, he offered some parting advice to the nation in his farewell address. Much of it included a condemnation of political parties as they posed a serious threat to the young nation. He also argued the country must avoid entangling alliances, particularly the war in Europe. Washington retired after eight years in office, thereby establishing the precedent of a two-term limit for American presidents, broken only by Franklin Roosevelt in the 20th century. With the retirement of Washington came the need for another presidential election. In a very close race, the winner turned out to be George Washington's vice president, John Adams. John Adams was an attorney from Massachusetts who was opposed to the Crown's policies in the years before the American Revolution. He later served in the Continental Congress and was part of the delegation which secured the involvement of the French in the fight against England. For eight years prior to the election of 1796, he had served as Washington's vice president and was clearly aligned with the Federalist camp. Now, it was his turn. The leader of the Democratic Republicans, Thomas Jefferson, was Adams' primary opponent in the election. The results were quite surprising. Adams won the election with a majority of electoral votes. However, Jefferson finished second and was named vice president. This quirk in the Constitution would later be fixed with the Twelfth Amendment, but in the meantime, the nation was led by a president from one party and a vice president from another. Unfortunately for Adams, he was following the father of the nation, George Washington, into the presidency, and his administration was characterized by difficult times. The French were angered by Jay's Treaty, America's agreement with England. In retaliation, the French seized several American ships. Once again, American trading rights as neutrals were being threatened. To avoid war with France, Adams sent diplomats to Paris to reach a settlement. The French foreign minister refused to meet with the Americans. Then the delegation was approached by three individuals, later referred to as X, Y, and Z, who told the Americans they could meet with the French if they were paid a sum of $250,000. The Americans refused to pay what essentially was a bribe. This incident came to be known as the XYZ Affair as a wave of patriotism and anti-French sentiment spread across the country. A quasi-war began as there was fighting between the Americans and French in the Caribbean, yet no declaration of war. Democratic Republicans continued to sympathize with the French, so the Federalist-controlled Congress passed legislation to suppress opposition to the war against France. The Alien and Sedition Acts were actually a series of acts passed by Congress. Three were aimed at foreigners who tended to support the Democratic Republican Party. One allowed the President to expel any foreigner he considered to be dangerous to the nation, while another gave him the authority to jail or deport foreigners during wartime. A third law extended the residency requirement for citizenship from five 
to 14 years. The Sedition Act was most controversial. It established limits on free speech by making it illegal to issue statements defaming or criticizing the president or the government. These were aimed at newspapers critical of the Federalists. Looking back today, they seemed to violate the First Amendment, but the Federalists not only controlled Congress, but the judiciary as well. This cartoon satirizes the fierce debate in Congress. Federalists acted as if war at home was imminent. Jeffersonians were infuriated. For many, fears of a strong central government attacking the civil liberties of its citizens seemed to be coming true. State legislatures in Virginia and Kentucky responded by passing separate legal responses to what they believed were attacks on the freedoms of people living within their states. These were called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. First, they argued the states had the right to judge the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress. Furthermore, if the national government exceeded its powers, states had the right to nullify any such laws. Initially, the authors of these resolutions were unclear. They feared prosecution under the Sedition Act. However, we now know they were written by James Madison, then a member of Congress, and Vice President Thomas Jefferson. Just think, President John Adams signed these bills into law, and his own vice president authored a major attack upon them. The last topic for this presentation will address the government's policy toward Native Americans in the era of the early republic. During Washington's administration, his Secretary of War, Henry Knox, embarked on a policy essentially aimed at assimilating Indians into American society. Attempts were made with the Iroquois and Cherokee, among others. This image shows a Cherokee settlement in the southeast where many did assimilate. However, at the root of this set of policies was the belief American culture was superior to that of indigenous peoples. This Creek House from 1791 demonstrates how many Native Americans living in the East used a combination of traditional and European items in their daily lives. This was also true for Indians living farther west, but many white settlers saw the presence of Native Americans on the land in the Ohio Valley as a barrier to American success. Even though the Northwest Territory was organized by land ordinances under the Articles of Confederation, there was a great deal of violence between pioneers and Native Americans living in the Old Northwest, as the United States government had never negotiated for access to the land. On two occasions, Indians defeated American forces. In one clash, over 600 American soldiers died. As mentioned earlier, the British, in defiance of the Treaty of Paris, continued to occupy several forts in the Northwest and supplied Native Americans with their efforts to resist the Americans. However, in 1794, under the leadership of General Mad Anthony Wayne, Indians living in the Ohio Valley were soundly defeated at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. This map identifies Indian land sessions from the last half of the 18th century. An arrow points to the location of the Battle of Fallen Timbers, which took place just outside of Toledo. Following this defeat, in 1795 the Shawnee and several other tribes of the Ohio Valley signed the Treaty of Grenville. The treaty ceded to the United States government most of the modern-day state of Ohio and part of Indiana. In return, the signers received a lump sum of money and an annual annuity. The area circled here roughly shows the territory ceded to the United States under the terms of the treaty. The Treaty of Granville was important to the United States because it established the Americans as the dominant power in the region and opened the Ohio Valley to settlement. It was also important to Native Americans as they received something they had been seeking for years. The United States formally accepted the principle of Indian sovereignty by virtue of residence over all lands Native peoples had not ceded. Many important issues were discussed in this presentation, which can now be reviewed. Several wide-ranging events from the presidencies of Washington and Adams were addressed in this presentation. However, maybe the most important concept to consider involves the idea of how to best divide governmental power. For example, should the national government be allowed to pass legislation like the Alien and Sedition Acts? What if it's wartime? What if there isn't a war? Does the Bill of Rights go far enough or too far toward protecting civil liberties? How strong should the central government be in relation to the states? These were important issues over 200 years ago, but do you know what? They continue to be important today. 
This concludes lecture number eight. I hope this information has been thought-provoking. The next few slides will include links to websites offering additional information as well as a list of sources used to develop this presentation. Have a great day.